we're here to discuss Heidegger's, well, how it's usually called in the public sphere, Heidegger's critique of technology. We would rather um, try to talk about or think after Heidegger's question concerning technology and what he means with terms like Gestell, which we will leave untranslated for now, and uh, the ordinary or commonplace um, perception of Heidegger is that he is against technology, that he believes that there's something demonic or evil at work in technology and that um, Heidegger dreams of a, a golden age, we could almost say, uh, of, of peasants um, that he tries to return to and that this is really what the so-called history of being is about. And as some may know, Heidegger himself uh, spoke to Richard Wisser at some point uh, in the late 60s and, and very clearly said that uh, he's not against technology. But in order to understand what he means with Technik and Michel, it's necessary to go into that, that thinking. So my, my first question, I guess, is how, how should one approach Heidegger's writings on technology? Well, there is an obvious answer. Uh, one should approach them as philosophical writings. So he does uh, a philosopher's job, which is to think about what is and to try to shed light on what is at work uh, in order for things to be in the way in which they are. So it's a diagnostic job that he does. Mm -hmm. the, uh, perhaps the word diagnosis can help here uh, to look inside and further um, with respect to the way in which we can also say things appear in our epoch. So that's a, a, a basic philosophical job and that's the job that he does, always in a very close dialogue, which is not easy to see um, if one is not prepared and, and especially not easy to follow in the, in the depth uh, that it attains with the philosophical tradition. If we think specifically, for instance, about these writings um, that these four lectures, and in particular this uh, lecture that is called uh, Das Gestell, or Die Frage nach der Technik, later on, uh, there is, just the first thing that comes to mind, there is very close dialogue with, uh, with Aristotle concerning all these questions of proximity and distance, which is, uh, like, in a way, the framework of uh, these lectures one should certainly have in mind what Aristotle says in his physics about topos and, and all these words, you know, when the word Abstand, there are words there in, in, in Aristotle um, which explore these spatial um, dimensions. And um, the thing is that Heidegger is in this dialogue, but with his own voice and with his own perspective, which is, as we know, or at least we know we can we say it, but I'm not sure we always know what that implies. He does this in a way that is not strictly speaking philosophical anymore. So um, what you mentioned um, is commonplace uh, about um, these writings, so that he is taking a kind of worldview which is contrary to, uh, to technology. I think we can set that aside rather quickly. Incidentally, there is a, a first, um, let's call it terminological question here, maybe a small one, not certainly not the most important one, but it's, it's a thing which I myself, uh, I don't really know how to solve this, but it's in the word technology. Mm, you know, in German there is technik and technologie, and perhaps te technology uh, is, indicates two specifically technological objects. Perhaps we could, we could say techniques, English as well, just to help us, or maybe there is a different word, I don't know, but just to help us to go uh, more in the direction of what we need to look at, namely um, a, a way to let things be, a, a way to bring things about, to bring them to light. So perhaps the word techniques helps us to go to the Greek, techne, and, um, and then that, that's the first step, and the other step, or the necessary step that 
complements that is to see that we are talking about uh, when we talk about techne and technique, we talk about two ways of bringing to light, bringing about hmm? um, one the Greek one, one the modern contemporary one. So we are already facing the problem of translation. It's uh, increasingly um, it, it, there's something that shows itself as soon as one reads Heidegger and tries to do what we're doing now, have to have a discussion uh, on Heidegger's thinking in a language that's not his own, in a language that very has to very extremely quickly translate, which might also have something to do with, with the way things are being let free into the open in uh, techniques. Now we will say techniques instead of technology, because technology Technology uh, implies technological objects, as you said, so the, the phones that we're using right now to record this uh, conversation. But Heidegger is not after objects, he's after the Wesen. And, and, and the, probably uh, not a very good translation for Wesen is essence. He's after the Wesen of technology. So perhaps we need to clarify also, sorry, the Wesen of techniques. Um, what it is that we mean when we say Wesen with Heidegger. Mm -hmm. Perhaps let me say just a few remarks since you introduced this uh, topic of translation. I think um, before we even s speak in terms of translation or ask ourselves what are the challenges of translating Heidegger and so on, which is a popular subject and, and also an important one, I think the very basic thing is that we, in whatever language we try to think or say something, we should make sure that we're actually saying something. Now, what, what very easily happens when we speak um, in a language that is different from the one in which a certain philosophical thought uh, has been uh, created in the first place is that um, we uh, fall into a way of speaking in which um, we, we what, in the end, we don't really say something anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, we are, we increasingly also lose the awareness of this. Um, because, why? Because very often then certain terminological choices, they just, uh, they are just accepted and there is a certain way of speaking becomes customary and we lose the feeling for the fact that we are, to put it, plainly, a little bit bluntly, we are not saying anything anymore. That, for instance, also concerns, as far as I can see, um, the word essence, not the word essence in general, but, uh, for instance, then this, this verb which is being built um, to, say, to convey the, the so-called verbal uh, way of speaking of the, of the German word Wesen, there I'm not really sure, perhaps I, somebody will correct me, a, a native speaker or somebody who is trying to articulate thoughts in English will correct me, but when, it, when we start to speak in terms of essencing, I'm not really sure that we are actually saying and indicating and showing a phenomenon anymore, that we are in touch with a phenomenon anymore, or, or if we are rather saying, okay, now I'm, I'm using the word essencing, which is in a way um, just a way to remind us of the fact that there is a, another German word there which says certain things. Sometimes I have the, the impression that when, when one reads translations, um, and I think that's an impression that is, uh, it's, it's not so difficult to have that impression because it's, it's quite obvious, you have the impression that the person who is, is speaking is not speaking himself, that, that there's somebody, there is in, you know, uh, recently, I came across this um, in, in skiing. When you comment a skiing race, uh, you have um, and, and you have a skier who is who is basically just trying to stay on his skis, but he's he's like a, a, a victim of the slope and of the way in which the slope is built. And there is this expression: he's a passenger of his skis. So he's, it's the skis that are dominating him, and he's just a passenger. Sometimes you have the impression that. Somebody is a passenger, like on the surface of a language, of a text written in another language, and just you know trying to to to, to stay on his feet, 
but basically remaining on the outside and not I mean, when, when you look at an accomplished skier, that skier will in a way own, own the slope and, and uh, you, he, will, he will have, to have this, this kind of sensitivity that allows him to smoothen you know, um, the, the difficulties of, uh, of the slope and so on. So I think that can maybe serve as an analogy um, for for two different ways of um, approaching, um, for instance, Heidegger's text in other languages. And there is one which just does this following the outside of the German text and basically putting in English words that reproduce or mimic this outside. But nothing is being said or one has the impression that there is not really actually the, the effort to say something, to, that the phenomenon is not seen. And then you have attempts to um, actually say something in another language, uh, which of course requires that in the first place you, you understand what is being said. And then once you understood what has been said, then you say, okay, now how do I say this in my language? And then of course there will be then differences because when you really say something in another, in another language then all this mimicking or this mimetic aspect um, is not so important anymore and when we talk about translation in the field of philosophy I think we really need to get away from um, this idea of having to give an, uh, an impression as close as possible to what the German or the original text more generally speaking, is that is really not interesting, not important. It doesn't matter. Fundamentally, I mean, we're not. It's not a service to to somebody uh, who should have a general idea of what is being said. That's not what philosophical translation is about. So um, we are back at the problem of uh, Wesen, yes. uh, essencing, or I think that is the most common translation. I, I myself did. I. I suggested a word, but I don't have the, the ambition, uh, because I know that it's not my job in a sense to suggest what will one day be a, a truly productive uh, translation of that term in English. But I just tried with this word, uh, word binding in, in English, uh, then which can then also serve to translate anbes and with a binding, but uh, just to get away from this essence thing and and at least introducing certain traits which are important in the word Wesen. Which also are within the English vernacular. Some, some of them, yes. This, yes. yes. Um, if we think of uh, the, the character of uh, Wären, mm, yeah. uh, which is not which is not Dauern, so we're not talking about just lasting mm, in a chronological sense. Uh, but then there is this... Um, uh, there is this... Um, Liveliness in the word, uh, in the word Wesen, this um, this inner inner movement, which um, which has to do with uh, actually with space and time. So Wesen means a kind of unfolding. Unfolding is also sometimes a verb which has been used, but um, in the sense of um, coming into a space of time and staying in a space of time. So this dimensional character of, of Wesen is, I think, very important. And um, when, you, when you look for a word which is capable of indicating certain traits, then clearly the first thing, and this happened to Heidegger as to any other thinker, is the first thing is you are thinking something. So you see this, this biding in this spatial and temporal sense, in this, in this uh, space of time, um, and then you realize that the word Wesen uh, speaks in, in a way or resonates with that and is capable of uh, giving a, in also a, a, a phonetic or, uh, form to this and is capable of indicating this character which you have in mind. The German Wesen, so in this case, like, uh, German was fortunate enough to have this word which happens to be the same word, which is in a way also a problem, that translates the Latin essentia. Mm -hmm. yeah. So 
that's one of those instances in which Heidegger takes a world which is already a world within a metaphysical context. And since he's, however, looking at something different or at a different trait, he, so to speak, recoins that world uh, because, he's, because his ear for the German language tells him, okay, that word can say that. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, he, he also makes that explicit. I mean, he warns uh, when he says Wesen, he says all the time, careful, yes. not in that sense. Yeah. Now let's hear it in this other sense. But it's the language which tells you, yes, no, I can say that or I can't say that. If I'm just to maybe mention this from my <coughs> personal experience in teaching Heidegger, um, <clears throat> Whenever I teach it to someone whose vernacular is English and who grew up or has been reading the Romantic poets, for example, mm -hmm. the word biding and abiding make more sense than essencing. Mm -hmm. Essencing is artificial, mm -hmm. uh, an artifice that, that makes no sense, but th then of course it's used um, in certain areas or uh, within certain groups, um, almost as a reinforcing of a certain you know, we could say almost like a power structure that mm -hmm. uh, probably also needs to remain on the surface for its own survival. Mm -hmm. But that's a different story. The, 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 so, so when we speak of the, 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 the Wesen der Technik, we don't speak of the essence of technology, so we don't look for what it is in the metaphysical sense, but we look for and unfolding or coming into and staying in a space of time. Is this what, what we are looking for or what we are trying to understand? Yes. Well, that also goes back to what we said at the beginning concerning this uh, framework of uh, distance and proximity, yeah. um, which um, encloses, in a way, this, this um, complex of, um, of lectures. Um, yeah, I think that is uh, that is what is the case, and especially when we look when we talk about Gestell, um, what we're looking at is um, the fact that th there is no time and no space. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a form of um, biding which um, comes in. The, um, in, a, in, a, in a persistence um, in which spatial and temporal relations in this original sense that Heidegger um, shows and, 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 uh, and brings to the philosophical discourse um, are basically absent. So we are looking at a defective modality of a space of time and what, the, what he indicates with the word Bestand, which is yes. uh, the name for the, the way, way of being, the manner of being, of uh, things, but also of the human being. Um, this Bestand is still a form of, uh, let's say, abiding. It's a way in which something comes into the open. Uh, and yet, in a um, dimension in which time and space have themselves become Bestand. Have themselves become a resource. Mm -hmm. So um, it's this, uh, let's call it, uh, just so we have a first understanding, this defective modality of uh, spatial temporal or spatial temporal um, binding that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, this is in the first place an experience that one has, when one, an experience when, if one exists in epoch in which we exist and what Heidegger gives is a diagnosis he, he uh, the, this diagnosis uh, implies um, shedding a light on uh, what are the let's call them structural relations mm -hmm. that are responsible for um, configuring this uh, uh, the abiding of um, that which abides in the form of what he calls Bestand. You, you have uh, um, in, these, in these lectures or texts, you have uh, um, to begin with, you have uh, das Ding, and you have this expression, which very often is made fun of, but it's, a, it's, it's an appropriate way to speak, and actually the only way in which we can say this, 
das Ding, Ding. And at some point you have der Bestand besteht. Hmm? Those two um, phrases uh, resonate. Hmm? And der Bestand besteht, that is uh, the experience of the way in which um, beings appear in the epoch of techniques, hmm? in the epoch of technicized um, beings, circumstances, in which space and time as well are um, technically conceived, uh, and, and a name for that can be uh, they are resources. Yes. And this comes about almost as a result of metaphysics, of the history of metaphysics. Or is that too much of an, of an, of an ex, external, superficial way of looking at it in terms of finding it? No, no, I wouldn't say superficial, but it's not, um, I don't think it's sufficient that it's maybe a bit dangerously too, um, uh, too uh, concise, mm -hmm. yeah. that way. Because uh, as a result, would almost mean that metaphysics is the cause mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, a, it's a destiny metaphysics. So it's uh, it's May I interject it's oh, one destiny of metaphysics. It's not the destiny of metaphysics. That that is correct. So, uh, so if I understand you correctly, you you would like to avert some perspective in terms of teleological yeah. uh, yes. Um, but it's um, but in a sense it is um, so the same law that let's call it law for a moment, that uh, governs the unfolding of uh, metaphysics. Um, that same law also brings about this um, extre extreme or ultimate version of, uh, of metaphysics that is this way of being, hmm? this the way of being that we can describe uh, with uh, the words uh, Bestand and, uh, and, and, and which shows the same structure uh, as other ways of uh, abiding in other epochs of metaphysics. So it's an, it's an ultimate form of abiding within a, a sequence or succession of forms whose law is is, uh, however, unique and common, um, and what I refer to when I speak about law, this goes then in, in the direction of, um, I think you mentioned that at the beginning of uh, what Heidegger called, comes to call this Geschichte, or more specifically, science Geschichte. So it's, uh, the German word for what we're, what we're looking at here is, techniques is ein Geschick, hmm? ein Geschick of Geschichte. So um, I think it's, all, it's, it's important to see that Heidegger is, um, on one hand, doing, as I said myself at the beginning, the job of a philosopher to give a diagnosis of the way in which things are in, a, in an epoch, but he's introducing a perspective which is entirely unprecedented and new. That, and he gives a, a different kind of framework for diagnosing um, the origin and implications of a certain form of being or abiding. And this different framework that he gives, uh, this is indicated with words like Geschichte, words like uh, Ereignis, words and phenomena always like Geschichte and Ereignis, but instead of having, as we have in a metaphysical perspective, just one manner of being and an origin of being, which is what a metaphysical thinker tries to respond to and tries to, to preserve. Now we have this dimension that we can be referred to as Geschichte, which is one to which the human being in the first place responds and by which the human being is in the first place uh, claimed and engaged. And then in the collaboration of this dimension of Geschichte and man, thanks to this 
collaboration or this fundamental relation which metaphysics doesn't see, um, a certain way of being comes about, a certain configuration of abiding um, becomes possible or, as I prefer to say, likely. And so, uh, when Heidegger determines the way of being in, of, of our epoch, this is fundamentally different from when um, Nietzsche or another thinker of the metaphysical tradition uh, attempts to just to say what is in terms of the being of beings that for him is the experience of um, of his epoch from within metaphysics from the sense of the will to power as the being of beings is spoken from within metaphysics and Heidegger is on the one hand within but without as well at once yeah even though I, I would more say he's from the very beginning outside uh, I, would, I would say that um, his his um, his reconstruction of metaphysics is something which is from the very beginning outside of uh, metaphysics. I think he's born outside of metaphysics. Yeah. Um, there is um, what he himself says about being in time. Uh, there is um, in being in time, which is itself already outside of metaphysics, but th th there are certain um, elements that still uh, connect, connected or can make us think of a metaphysical setting or framework and transcendence and so on, but he himself is very, very explicit and elaborates on that a lot, also in publications which uh, have recently appeared or still have to appear, that he doesn't stop saying that, but it is from the very beginning something different. You, you can't really stay, that's not a possible stance. Mm -hmm. uh, Bit within and a bit without. And when we speak of the end of metaphysics, etc., it's just important to point out that Heidegger is not deconstructing anything. Mm -hmm. That there is not uh, an, an attempt to, to look at something as others have, have mm -hmm. almost appropriated Heidegger um, and, and claim that what he's doing is going back through a supposed history or rather historiography. And, and then deconstructs texts and then rebuilds something else. So there's something quite different going on. Mm -hmm. The perspective is very different than in a resentful uh, deconstruction. Yes, no, I, I don't even know if we should um, uh, elaborate too much on this. No, no, but, uh, we should yeah. elaborate, I think, on what is going on. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Just but, to make the, 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 that yeah. distinction very clear, because yeah. in the public mind, very often, the reaction is, oh, so he's deconstructing. There's, there's, there's quite something, something different going on. Yeah. By the way, this the word deconstruction has a, um, has a phenomenological origin. We know that the, in, in the phenomenological method, and Heidegger himself in his early writings, um, he articulates that uh, phenomenological method in terms of um, Destruction, reduction, and construction. Mm -hmm. um, but, and he actually he actually does that, uh, but um, he doesn't use those words anymore, just because um, there are other words for saying that. But in, in, in his Beiträge zur Philosophie, um, what he does he, is he just uh, finds words which are more appropriate to what is going on there. And the thing is that we must see is that he has this entirely new um, experience of an onset or of a beginning. Mm -hmm. So he, the, the, the point where I think we need to begin to look at this is what he calls the, the other beginning. Mm -hmm. And this other beginning changes everything instantly. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a, a perspective on metaphysics, which is from the very beginning, not metaphysical anymore, and allows you to do what and this is what Heidegger does. He, from the very moment in which he, and this is, as I said before, the way in which he's born in philosophical terms, in this completely different element, which we can refer to with, uh, with this expression, the other beginning. And this um, 
prompt you to do what? And this is what he does for decades. To enter a dialogue with the metaphysical tradition, trying to do what? When he says you have to be more Kantian than Kant and more Greek than the Greeks and all these uh, very often misunderstood expressions. What is he looking for? He's looking for, um, be because this is so new, he's looking for um, traces of this, this other beginning, which is the only thing that he's interested in, um, for, for, let's say, confirmations or traces of that in the metaphysical tradition. And, and then he says, oh, look at this, um, in, in, in this perspective of, of the other beginning, these relations are in place. Now look what Kant is doing. And then we know, for instance, now I'm talking about Kant, he says, look, Kant, here there was the opportunity to see a certain thing, but here Kant doesn't seem to see that because in the, within a metaphysical perspective, that is to say, a perspective that um, is, let's say, interested primarily in, fundamentally, in giving a foundation to beings, um, what for him, what for Heidegger, is uh, this, this new element and the traits uh, and characters of this element which he sees, they, he, he spots those in the metaphysical tradition, but he sees, he observes, how they never become decisive, they never become what the metaphysical tradition can recognize as the actual and most fundamental element of thinking, and let's call them Unterschied, uh, Anfang, you know, these words that he has, um, how they come up all the time, but... Ab abgrund. Abgrund, yeah. But they cannot become, within a metaphysical perspective, they cannot become um, the proper element of thinking and the element that thinking must, in the first place, engage, meta, engage in as the most fundamental uh, dimension, because metaphysically you are still called to give a foundation to beings as such and uh, within a whole. So, so that's what what, I, what motivates him, and he doesn't stop being in this dialogue, and and clearly in within. This dialogue, he reconstructs. He has to give the version of a metaphysical position from within his perspective, and I think the only thing that one can see is that this, these reconstructions that he gives, they are they are rich, they are rich, um, but in the specific sense of this more, this more which which on the other on the one hand we must say we will never be able to think in the way which Kant thought. I mean, there is no way of be, being more Kantian than Kant in, yes. this, in the sense that we understand better what Kant was actually thinking. But more Kantian means, um, in a way, shedding light on a kind of, now I'm going into a, an image that's always a bit dangerous, but shedding a light on the, the ambience or in which a metaphysical thinking took place, and suddenly you, you, you shed light in a place which remained in the dark as that thinking was building. So we, we've, we've touched on several highly crucial notions, for example, in the dark, which speaks to Verbergen, mm -hmm. and concealment, which is uh, the English translation you're looking for. To Unterschied Anfang, Abgrund, ordinary translations would be difference, beginning or onset, and uh, abground or abyss, and just to bring this back a bit to techniques uh, or technology in ordinary, if metaphysics tries to give foundation to beings as such, then techniques is doing it in a certain sense, isn't it? It's exactly what it's what, what, what that process, if you like. Uh, is engaging in what's at work it is is giving or trying to give a stable a, a, a ground um, <clears throat> that then can be it serves as the foundation for for what it means to be which as Max Planck says and Heidegger often quotes him only what's measurable is real 
Yes, I think here uh, perhaps it could be appropriate to say that here on the we are at the point where, however, then something different becomes visible. So yeah. if you if you on the one hand show how this is still an instance of uh, abiding, on the other hand, one can see that uh, there is something completely different uh, happening. Um, with respect to what could be f finding an ultimate principle uh, that gives a, a foundation, um, a, a first and ultimate foundation to the being of beings um, in the whole, uh, because what you what you see what you see if you describe this if you describe this ambition and what what. What brings it about? What governs it? This um, this form of uh, abiding. You see that this is uh, doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't come from anywhere. You you see this um, this um, circularity, which is uh, um, for its own sake. So basically, what you um, unearth is something that, with a term that elaborates on. Nietzsche's thinking but brings it a step further. Uh, you can call the will to will. So what you're describing is um, an utter and complete senselessness. And whereas in, a, in the metaphysical tradition, the the purpose of finding a principle of being is that of securing the point from which a sense can be built and constructed. And this point you don't find when you describe the abiding that is the one of, um, of techniques. Basically what you find is a that this principle, which seems to be at work in all this, is a principle of principlelessness, if, uh, if we may say so. And this, this then actually points uh, to something already which is not metaphysical anymore. Mm -hmm. And this means that the diagnosis was from the beginning not a metaphysical one, because this is not a metaphysical diagnosis anymore. So it might be fair to say that Heidegger sees or attempts to see and, and investigate the self-concealings, if you like, or the self-concealment within the metaphysics, what it, for, what it has forgotten in any given moment where it springs up and... You mean when he is in a dialogue with the metaphysical yes. thinking? Yeah, yeah the, uh, clearly, because for him it's... Uh, what he sees has to do with basically, basically or one way in which we can say what he sees is that he sees um, that what the Greeks call aletheia yeah? now, um, but in its own right. He says the Greek, the Greek, the element of Greek thinking is the element of aletheia and physis. And what is, in his perspective, the way he experiences and sees it, um, what is, however, also astonishing about this is that um, aletheia is, in a way, caught up in in physis. It, it it is the fundamental experience of being is that of physis, and it is physis that owns Aletheia. This, and this begins with Parmenides. So, and um, Aletheia, so to speak, in its own right, is never what for the Greeks is what needs to be thought. Is never the primary original element of thinking. Now, once that Heidegger understood that, this is this, um, the ignition of his thinking. This is how he becomes a thinker by having um, become aware of this, by having suddenly perceived this. And then what, what does he do? Uh, he, tr he, he walks through in, in a way in which I think this has never happened. I mean, in, in, and also, if we just look at the array of, of what is the product of this, <laughs> writing uh, like a madman, yeah. uh, uh, because he's saying, okay, it's also a way to find a stance in this element, because when you're the first and you see something which is so, it's at the same time, it's just a, a, a little shift with respect to the, the, 
tradition of thinking in which we stand, the metaphysical tradition, it's a little shift, but it's enormous. It's, uh, it, it opens up a completely new perspective. So what he does is he reconstructs metaphysical positions, trying to see, well, what happens here in terms of um, this element, which he then calls Lichtung and so on, um, in the way in which this metaphysical position is built, in which being is determined, the notion of being is determined, and so on. Um, as it's, but it's, um, he doesn't have a, uh, an ambition to give a historically exact, whatever that means, uh, account of anything. He's, and, and that's, I think, legitimate, and anything else would be strange. He's, the only thing that he is motivated by is to articulate this unprecedented dimension that now thinking is required to respond to and to give a form to and to preserve. That's what he tries to do. So when he thinks through again the, the history of well, modernity, you know, the history of modern metaphysics, um, he does say somewhere that the nuclear bomb or the atomic bomb exploded with Descartes. Mm -hmm. um, and he also, he, when we, we spoke about Kant, um, in terms of Kant's, and I, I want to get to, to Gestell from Kant, or the way that Gestell is now translated is no longer as in the framing, it's, it's usually now translated as positionality. So it comes with an understanding that, that Stellen, that, that, that the Stellen is more important than the aspect of frame. Maybe. And that with what what takes place with Kant, not intentionally, but in the with transcendental logic and transcendental idealism, that, it, that the categories of the subject determine the objectivity of the object. To put it in very uh, ordinary terms, it, it is what ultimately is is that logic breaks open. Um, it's a realm of possibilities where. It becomes very likely that you you cannot fly to particularly like you cannot fly to the moon with Aristotelian logic. Mm -hmm. you, you can do that with Newtonian physics and, and Kantian transcendental logic. Why? Because you set the parameters of of time and space as Bestand mm -hmm. that are then calculatable, quantifiable, measurable, and therefore usable to posit. As a set and stellen, um, what is desired in terms of a representation and, and a, a, a previous Vorstellung that then leads to a Herstellung, so to a product of the will. Yeah, uh, perhaps one aspect which um, I would like to, um, to stress here is that it's always a matter of perspective and in what context are we looking at things, but. I think it's important to distinguish between uh, a scientific um, way of, um, and in particular with respect, with respect to modern science, the scientific, uh, for instance, way of conceiving space and time, as it happens from Newton onwards in mathematical physics, and um, the philosophical one. What is the important thing that we need to remember? That the metaphysical um, attempt at giving a foundation to beings is always the attempt to preserve the, the conditions for a human world. Mm -hmm. uh, and whereas this aspect um, is not present in science, and especially in technicized science, as, as we can re refer to uh, science when we, when we speak of modern science, um, and for instance, when we talk about um, Space and time, and these um, space and uh, space and time as dimensions which are now um, without distance, mm -hmm. and where there is, or what Heidegger in these lectures, um, including that on Gestell calls uh, Abstand, mm -hmm. the distancelessness. Um, then, what I think we need to look in the first place at um, these notions of space and time. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Newton would say space and time has absolute dimensions. That is to say, independent of man, because that is uh, uh, clearly you can uh, what you said about Kant uh, and so on. We can look at a, a, a preparation of a certain thinking in these terms as well. But one point that discriminates between uh, a scientific way of um, instituting a certain Stellen and a philosophical way is that um, in science you have the interruption of um, the, the relation between dimensions of time and space and the human being. They become, uh, Newton says, or actually that's the way in which Leibniz um, sees Newton's physics, suddenly space and time become absolute and real dimensions, which are independent of man and also of God. That's what worries Leibniz about Newton's uh, physics. And, um, and here we are already, in a sense, more advanced than what philosophy does, more advanced in, uh, in the direction of, uh, of Gestell, simply, simply because um, time and place here are already ready to be uh, just conceived as, uh, as resources in the way in which we do. Whereas the interesting thing then when Heidegger diagnoses this and what is, what is really the dimension of his entire um, diagnosis of, um, of uh, the biding of uh, techniques um, is that he shows a, a, a fundamental relation of man or the man the way in which man is involved in all of this, namely in a response to ein Geschick, to a certain way of, not I'm conceiving, you would perhaps say, I would say disabsconding uh, beings, um, which, is, uh, which is not a metaphysical uh, relation anymore. So what, what Heidegger does is he, he diagnoses this dimension which Everything is a, is a resource, and including space and time, unrelated to man. Everything is absolute in its being bestand. Uh, but the, what is shocking, so the initial shock of all of this, is that all of this cannot be without the human being. But what kind of fundamental relation is involved here? In what way does man collaborate fundamentally to make all of this likely to how is man in, involved and the way in which man is involved uh, this is uh, can be seen in terms of what he, he at, from a certain point on calls ereignis so it is this sometimes we speak in terms of structure because it's just an first and quick way to say something, yeah. but it's the, the structure of Ereignis which um, suddenly one becomes aware of if one takes seriously the experience of what is, of, of the way of disabsconding beings uh, in our time. Well, when, just the uh, shocking realization that in all of this in which Man seems to be just himself a resource in, in these cybernetic circuits uh, which make up uh, what we call reality. But the, as Heidegger says in another lecture, in the, the, the ultimate circuit of all of these circuits hmm, that makes all these circuits go is a circuit in which man is involved in a response to a demand, to a claim, to a will. Hmm, and this fundamental response or relation between man and what wills all this to be that way, that is, this, that is already a I mean, That's the way in which, which Heidegger is um, awakened into what at some point he will come to call a Heidegger. So, um, I, I started from this distinction between the metaphysical and the scientific uh, way of conveying this, basically what we can call this will element, you yourself introduced that term, I think that is a good term to begin to talk about what, uh, what we're looking here, or what we're looking at 
from the point of view of uh, sense relations. Mm -hmm. and, and will is clearly what is inscribed in, in Stellen. Mm -hmm. But will, obviously, just to <clears throat> make a... Um, Maybe not not a point that that's perfectly on point, but but will uh, when you talk about will and technology and and the human being and certain I mean I think going into cybernetics it's but maybe into artificial intelligence um, what Heidegger I think sees and this is what he articulates in his essays is that we are not free in this according what's going on mm -hmm. we are. We are the, that strange being that executes, that is ordered and challenged and uh, claimed to, to do something. Um, and that this is indicated somewhat even in language, right? You know, we, we must use technology for peaceful uh, masses. We must, well, now today we can maybe think of how to master the digital age. That indicates that there's something. If something doesn't apply as a word, but just to mm -hmm. uh, um, try to express this, that some things at work, that that is not us, that's not human, mm -hmm. and but that challenges us and very much orders us to do something. Mm -hmm. And this is, to, I guess, to a certain degree for Heidegger. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But then my question is also: is, is where is it coming from? If, if that question is at all the right question, it might be the wrong question. And speaking of, of cybernetics and the processes now of, 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 of what's, what's going on in terms of acceleration, ex exponential growth of intelligence, ex intelligence explosion as well, to bring that term up, which is a, a term of, of, of modernity. Um, is there something at work that comes to us from a future that's, that's decisively not human? Um, and whether there is or could be an exit, mm -hmm. a way out, or if that's completely not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also. <laughs> and all, all of these are, are important questions. Let me begin with um, what you said about uh, and, and freedom. I think the way in which you put it is, uh, from my point of view, adequate. Uh, the thing is that um, we where there is an unfreedom, there is a freedom, right? Yes. So the whole point is to experience f fully and, uh, you know, honestly, and also have the courage to experience entirely the unfreedom. Why? Because that, precisely that, and I should say only that, also opens the experience of an unprecedented freedom because there is no way to, um, to just, you know, invent a notion of freedom or one which we would like. And it's the, the access to this unprecedented notion of freedom, which is also implied in, in, in Ereignis, is to experience the unfreedom, which is a very peculiar unfreedom. It's a, the, the unfreedom um, that is, is also, it's not a metaphysical unfreedom in, in which we are. So um, then you say, um, this unfreedom, what does it imply? It implies that something is um, exacting mm, or, or of almost forcing us to implement then a certain way of letting things be because we're, we're still talking about that, mm. strange as it might seem because there is not much letting or allowing and so on. Everything is forceful and willed and coerced and exacted and required and so on, but we're still talking about letting be. Um, now, I, I think what, what philosophy always does, philosophy um, just, first of all, tries to, to diagnose and tries to respond to what is the most fundamental trait that is concerning and engaging man. And what Heidegger at some point realizes is that um, this, there is a, a, a Implicit in this uh, in, in this fundamental structure, which he comes to call um, Ereignis, there is a turning. So it can it can turn one way or another way, and we are not, he realizes. But I think that's 
not so difficult to for us to then to to, to accept or to see um, is that we are not the masters of the way in which this turns. He re he that that also he realized that this is something that man has always known in a certain way. Just to give one reference, uh, if you think about Greek uh, Greek tragedy. And for instance, the way in which Hölderlin really tried to understand Greek tragedy, which is really, really unique and very far-reaching, um, and very, just to use a word which today is a, is a good pass to, to, to the fact that you're saying something relevant, innovative. Um, well, tragedy is this, when, when suddenly the most the fundamental relation, which is the, fun, the relation of man to truth suddenly turns and everything and the world changes and the color of the world changes. Mm -hmm. um, and the way in which Hölderlin describes this is, well, suddenly all sense is taken out of the world. Mm -hmm. And and what the, is nature or the most fundamental relations suddenly hit man with the violence uh, in which they don't hit him when uh, the world is full of color when the when the world is full of sense and the the tragic um, element is just this um, this su sudden um, uh, occurrence of the the sense being um, drained from the world and man being confronted with naked truth with the most fundamental truth. But in this in this way, which is which he cannot bear, so th that is an, um, an instance I, I think of what uh, of that which then Heidegger comes to call care. So if we uh, an insight into tragedy is is uh, in a way uh, a possibility to substantiate or to 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 seek help. In trying to understand what Heidegger is pointing at, when he um, when he um, identifies this, what for him is he's just describing, you know, uh, he's just really describing structure, a structure of reality as from the way in which it appears to him, yeah. and that there is this th that things can turn one way, and then and everything is thrown into senselessness, and then the same structure. There is this turning, and, and then there is a fullness of sense. And we are not the masters of that, but because you were asking about the way out, yes. uh, just quickly, and then yeah, no, yeah. you go. Uh, certainly, all of this always happens. Mm, this turning, which is something which, um, as you said, is not something human. Mm, uh, nothing of this takes place without the involvement of man in one way or another. Which is the, that's the the way out. Is the the involvement is at the one at once what keeps us within and keeps us enforcing and executing and acting. Um, but at once is also what sh could show us, or as Hölderlin puts it somewhere, right, that, that time itself tears open the horizon, mm -hmm. and that, that let us. Might give us the opportunity yeah, I, I think, to leave, yeah. but what I what I want to ask is if that has to do how we respond to what is showing itself. It is about the response, isn't it? It's about the claim. So there remains that realm of freedom. Yeah, I, I would mean, say it, it, it is about responding full stop. So yes. what you are calling a way out, which is uh, how you would say I care in my life. So a turning of this fundamental relation. Um, this is, say, the, the version um, within this completely new, new perspective uh, of the way out from the platonic cave, in a way. Um, so uh, This can only take place if it is, and to the extent to which it is seconded by man, in which man, the human being, the thinking being, responds to it. So that we cannot make the way out, we cannot force it, we cannot bring it about, yes. but certainly this turning um, will not take place without man, the human being, acknowledging it and being ready to acknowledge it. So we can do nothing, 
but we need to do what we can do and what we are required to do, namely to think, uh, because uh, there is there is no freedom if not in responding to that which shapes our world in the most fundamental sense. And this, and Eragnes is just um, a new way, uh, a new attempt to establish the fundamental relation that shapes a human world. The, the, the question, though, is just to, to, to bring this out maybe a bit more clearly to, to someone who isn't um, all too familiar with, with Heidegger, is what is meant by thinking. Because to put this very bluntly, maybe too simplistically also, in, in a time where of optimization of rational processes, um, of, of system intelligence and artificial intelligence, where consciousness is confused with thinking, where um, evaluative um, self-learning machines slash algorithms um, are deemed to be more productive, faster than human mind, brain could ever be, because why? Because we cannot even fathom to process data at the speed that AI, X, Y could do. Um, what is it that, how human thinking is, is, how is it radically different from, from the way that thought or thought processes, etc., are, are mostly conceived of? Okay. There are a few things which uh, we can say uh, in a very straightforward way, um, very in a, in a very decided way, let's say. Um, one of those is that uh, what is called uh, thinking in the context that we are, you are referring to at the end, that is just simply calculating. There is not, there is not much more to say. That that's um, compute computing. It's, uh, it's um, the, the version of thinking that corresponds, or that is in an analogy, uh, to Bestand. Uh, Maybe there is as much uh, aletheia, or this abscondedness, uh, in Bestand as there is thinking in the computing that we do when we, um, when we operate and manage uh, Bestand and, and Get, get and keep the circuits, uh, the cybernetic circuits uh, going. So there's no thinking involved uh, there. It's computing and calculating. It's, uh, it's, it's literally also something which, uh, you see, you know, computing and calculating is something that in, in their own way animals do as well. If you, if you look at a, at a lion when you know, there was an antelope there in the distance, then he's computing the speed that you know, at which he has to run in a certain direction in order to capture that antelope. Yeah. So computing is something that animals, or calculating is something that animals do as well. Clearly, our capacity to compute is potentiated uh, by the fact that uh, we, we, we come from this metaphysical tradition, so we have uh, ways to boost our capacity to to calculate, which clearly are not accessible to animals. The much more difficult question is uh, what, what thinking consists in. And here, I, let me just for a moment um, say something about um, the way also in which maybe it's, it can be reasonable to approach Heidegger's text, namely to take them literally. You know, there is this very um, well known and often quoted uh, lecture, one of his last. Uh, Lecture courses, was uh, heißt Denken, what, uh, which has these, well, we have these two meanings of heißen, what requires us, what requires thinking, I mean, that's the most fundamental sense, and the more mm -hmm. superficial meaning is what does thinking mean, but actually yeah. that's not what is meant. The, it's the other, the first uh, meaning that we need to consider in the first place. And there you have uh, both that. Um, claim or proposition which uh, was taken or understood and received in such uh, with, with big scandal, die Wissenschaft denkt nicht. On the other hand, you have something which 
receive much less attention, we don't know what thinking means yet. We, we, we cannot think. So, but both of these, they belong, they belong together. And now, when you ask what does thinking mean, I think we... But it's not so easy to take that seriously and literally because we, we really don't even know what it means that we cannot think. But Heidegger gives some indications to that respect. And, and first of all, one has to, at least at a very superficial level of interpretation, acknowledge that he refers that to, to himself in the first place. It's not an accusation that he's making to anyone else. He says, look, ladies and gentlemen, as far as I can see, from what I understand what thinking ought to be, what I am capable of doing is I'm not yet there. He's making this kind of statement. And that has to do, what can it, what can it refer to? Well, it can refer to a, um, a, um, a purity and directness of our capacity to, to yield to this most fundamental trait, uh, which is, once again, let's call it the trait of uh, Unterschied, um, the, the pure yielding to that, which is the most uh, fundamental relation in which we stand as human beings, which is also the relation from which we can understand what it means to be uh, mortal. Um, and what, what Heidegger is just stating there is, well, I think I've seen that this is what, what thinking is in the first place. And from there also we can understand the relation between thinking and thinking, which is then always uh, a bit dangerous because it, it goes in directions of you know, playing with words or bringing in half poetical things, as he himself would say, which are not pertinent, but um, I think it is the, the purity, and I use the word purity because he uses it with respect to Socrates, yeah. um, of yielding to this, that he, I guess, that is, I mean, what else could it be, that he has in mind when he says, this is what thinking would, would be. And uh, I think what he would claim for himself is to have raised, um, this issue in terms of indicating the dimension that requires a certain response from us. And he's saying, look, the adequate response, the adequate way of the human being to um, respond to this, and I, I, I use the word yielding uh, to this, uh, really owning it, um, this is what thinking should be. And this is also, I think, what he gives as a task to future things. He says, well, when somebody else comes and tries to, you know, to, to say all this in his own terms in a different way, a thousand years from now, yeah. he said, well, as far as I can see, he will, he will do it in a completely different way. And problem, he doesn't even need to know me, but it'll have to do with the, hum, the human being begin, be, beginning to um, to, to be able to dwell in this, in this original trait um, in a way which the human being has not been, been capable of, 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 of dwelling so far. Because we also need to, need to keep in mind um, when we talk about uh, what does thinking mean and so on and where are we as a humanity with respect to thinking. Uh, this is something that Husserl also noted at some point where he said, look, from the point of view of learning what it is to think, uh, we're really only at the beginning. Like, what are 2,000 years? Are nothing. You know, it's, it's strange because uh, philosophy has, has as its dimension legitimately millennia, you know, mm -hmm. or centuries and millennia. That's the dimension, the proper dimension of philosophical thought. And so from the point of view of somebody who is trying, attempting something in the dimension of philosophy, we can say 2,000 years are really the blink of an eye. So we are really only beginning to, to realize, hey, what's this thing being a human being? And okay, oh, this it seems to be that this is what in the first place we need to relate to and find a stance in. 
this is what thinking tries to do. Philosophical thinking tries to find that. There is no other meaning to philosophical thinking than trying to give this to to to, to get us into in, in, in tune with uh, to, to get us in tune with the, the first, most fundamental relation that uh, that that concerns us. Um, and then uh, just to uh, just to draw uh, the line to something Different. It's strange because, on the other hand, physics thinks in terms of billions and billions of years. It's it's strange. That's yeah. not at all a dimension that in which we can go philosophically. To go into billions of years philosophically, it doesn't make sense. So, for, in a certain perspective, philosophy is much more limited. I mean, philosophy is much much more, um, more much humbler in this sense. Yeah. But it's just millennia. But millennia. Yeah. But, but this kind of going into the billions is, is, a, is a very recent development. It's not something that, that would occur even to, to a thinker of, of the medieval or scholastic era or epoch, or especially not to the, to the Greeks. And, and obviously, when we use the word eon, which is a Greek, but now means something completely different. It's now a, a pure quantitative and ever expanding. Right? It's, it's expanding with the arrival of the number zero to... to Western or Occidental thinking, if you like, there's an explosion into the positive as well into the negative. So we, we can now move infinitely far um, into the minus 20 billion years or however old the universe is, and I, I guess that that changes probably every week. Um, and of course, it's expanding spatially, it's expanding temporally. How much longer will the sun, uh, the sun survive before it explodes or implodes? Um, which which evokes images of, of the apocalypse if we want to go down down that road, uh, and, and the Big Bang evokes images of of Genesis and creation that that's mm -hmm. completely devoid of, of any kind of a, of sense. Mm -hmm. right? There's no sense left. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, then when we look at philosophy, we say there's a, a passage in Heidegger's text. I think. Um, is it what is philosophy? I think uh, um, when well, he says the thinking requires, it took thinking two thousand years to think through identity mm -hmm. and difference. Mm -hmm. So we, and in that sense, when when we collapse it back to to a, a more, if you could say, more so dimension, two thousand years are immensely rich, but then at the same time, just the beginning. So where we are for, for Heidegger is, and then, then structurally it's very interesting to see that, that the techniques um, and what it means to be a technological human being means to become transhuman. It means to become, which, which is just a euphemism for being non-human, right? It's, 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 I mean, interestingly enough, trying to become immortal is still predicated on mortality. Mm -hmm. Trying to be transhuman still requires some sense of humanness um, but it's trying to move away from it and what what it what it what what if you like people in, in mostly engaged in executing the demands of being in 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 our epoch have to work against or are working against uh, out of necessity is death is mortality mm -hmm. and they have to explode themselves into the Temporal indefiniteness of the of the digital what of, of virtuality because mm -hmm. it, it might be a completely it, it will be probably a very different temporality if if we are theoretically really uploaded uploaded to the cloud or something right? but but I guess what I'm trying to to point to is why that necessity to work against mortality. Yeah, so why, why are we obsessed with ab ab abolishing death yeah, yeah. or annihilating death? Yeah. It, it's a funny thing, you know, the abolition of death has a, has a funny side, I think. Um, but I, I, th the, I, I think in order to answer that, probably we would have to uh, acknowledge uh, and have a sense um, 
what it means that, that we are not mortal yet. <laughs> so that learning what it is to think coincides uh, with uh, becoming the mortal being. Those two things are they're two ways of saying the same thing. Um, and so, you know, um, I think a, a, an important uh, distinction that we need to make, and you, uh, you brought that up uh, without explicitly pointing at it, um, is uh, between executing or implementing a um, sense of being, mm -hmm. um, which is what we do when we um, potentiate our cybernetic circuits, and, and which we also do when we um, basically outsource humanity uh, into, into a machine. And um, I don't know if, if, if the word is capable of um, marking the difference in the way in which it should be marked, but what, what we need is a word which says what is not merely executing and implementing a certain sense of being, which is what all of us do, in the sense that all of us uh, necessarily do, uh, because we, we, are not the, we cannot decide in what sense of being uh, we are called to, to implement. The difference is between just implementing and executing it, which and, and the abolition of death is part of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's also part of, uh, of the, the bringing this uh, oblivion to its of, 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 of being and therefore of, of, of mortality to its just ultimate consequence. Um, so executing or implementing on the one hand and um, responding to and actually sustaining in our being on the other hand. Mm -hmm. So we, we could also say um, irresponsible an irresponsible response to the fundamental trait um, of being, or a responsible one, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's that's really the that also refers to what we said before concerning the, the way out. Mm -hmm. So, on the one hand, there, as human beings, we can do nothing but um, responding to what we are claimed by what. But then there are, let's say, fundamentally two different ways of, of doing so. The irresponsible one and the responsible one. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, the responsible one involves uh, an awareness and it and involves a, um, a, in order to do it in a, in a formal way, also a kind of uh, preparation uh, and, uh, and just you need to be born in a certain way to, to do that. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that is the fundamental distinction that we need to be aware of, so that we can then also put put into 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 perspective, into perspective um, these uh, developments that you were referring to concerning uh, transhuman, posthuman, this really big confusion that is uh, going on there, or uh, speaking of you know the word intelligence in the expression artificial intelligence yeah. and can computers think all these questions which are just pseudo questions meaning that we haven't done our homework in defining what we are talking about so all of these discussions uh, are based have as their presupposition uh, the fact that we do not touch the fundamental confusion that is at the basis of there is a very strong imperative to preserve. So the, the, the best preserved item in our epoch is, and, and the one that is really protected, is confusion. So basically, we do not think. Yeah. So, so not thinking is really in a very comfortable position. We go to great lengths to, to, to defend that. <laughs>